Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the public lecture hosted by Chiropact for the Kelly Institute for Formal Ethics and Cosmology. I guess a lot of you would appreciate it if I took the last one. Yeah, so my name is Sunandu. Um, I am the Outreach and Engagement Manager at Chiropact, and I am also the main host uh, for this event tonight. So it is incredible to see so many of you in person and also online. Um, thank you all for your interest uh, in this JWST public lecture series. Um, I know actually many of you have indicated or suggested us this topic a while back. Um, and now it is an exciting time for all of us to hear about this topic as JWST has been taking data for a few months and many project members are actually working on the early signs involving the first batch of data. Um, and today we are actually very uh, honored to have invited one of our postdoc uh, researcher, Ren Seuss, to speak about uh, distant galaxies and how JWC has advanced our understanding on that front. Um, so before we get started and before I introduce Ren, I would also like to give a big shout out to the entire team who has been helping and supporting this event behind the scenes. So first of all, I would like to introduce my virtual co-host today, Renee, who is handling um, online communication. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Brene Hatna. I am the data curator and storyteller at KaiPak. So I'm just here to facilitate sort of science communication, which is what tonight is all about. So yeah, happy to be here. Talk to y'all online. Thank you, Renee. And uh, for our large online crowd, we also have chat moderators who are all subject matter experts on this, on this topic to help with all those online questions. And I will also let them to quickly introduce themselves. So first we have Phil. Uh, hi there, I'm Phil Mansfield, a postdoc at Stanford University. Uh, I study how dark matter and galaxies are related, and I love to learn more about how galaxies can be destroyed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Phil. Um, and next we have Simon. Welcome everyone, my name is Simon Beer. I'm also a, a postdoc here at Stanford. I work with gravitational lenses and have also the pleasure to work with JWST data. Fantastic. Next we have Mia. Hi everyone, my name is Mia <laughs> My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm also a postdoc at Stanford and Kaipak. I mostly study galaxies at the total opposite end of the universe from what Ren's going to be talking about today. So mostly the stuff that's really close to our Milky Way. And fun fact, I learned yesterday that Ren and I actually went to the same high school. So shout out to North Carolina in the comments. Awesome. And last but not least, we have Richie. Hi, everyone. I'm Richie. I'm a fourth year PhD student at KaiPak working with Risa and also a lot of the folks here with Phil, me, and also Ren. I work also on dwarf galaxy formation theory, modeling their star formation histories and understand what's the life cycle of these very smallest galaxies in the universe. Fantastic. So uh, for all of you who are online joining us, uh, most of the questions will be directly answered by those chat moderators at the moment. The rest of those will be saved for the Q&A at the very end of this event. And for those of you who are joining us in person, save your questions until the very end of the Q&A. And of course, you will also have a chance to directly talk to Ren after the event if you want. Um, so I guess now uh, I would have the absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ren Seuss. Um, so Ren is a Stanford Santa Cruz Cosmology Fellow and also UC Santa Cruz Chancellor's Fellow um, at KaiPak and Stanford University. Um, she did her undergrad at CU Boulder um, and also got her master's and PhD um, from UC Berkeley. So Ren is actually, well, actually involved in many JWC um, science projects um, as a member of the NERCAM instrument team. And she is also scientifically very interested in learning how galaxies uh, and why they die and how their sizes change over time. So, well, I cannot wait to hear about all of that. Thank Well, I'm so excited to be here tonight. 
I'm so excited that so many of you are here in person and online. Um, so I'll be telling you about uh, the, the new James Webb Space Telescope uh, and what we're already starting to learn about galaxies in the extremely distant universe. Um, so, you know, like was said earlier, you know, we've only been getting data from this telescope since mid-July, so it's really the beginning of, of a very exciting era. So I'm going to start by talking about what galaxies actually are. Uh, so if you look up, you know, the Wikipedia de definition, um, they're systems of stars, stellar remnants, interstellar gas, dust, and dark matter that's gravitationally bound. So of those components of a galaxy, stars are probably the most familiar one. Either stars light our very own sun. Um, they come in a variety of different uh, masses that correspond to different colors. Uh, another component uh, of galaxies are these so-called stellar remnants. So these are white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. And this is what you get after you wait for a very long time and let stars go through their whole life cycle and then die. And so the kind of end products of that stellar evolution you also find in galaxies. And then the next component are, uh, is gas and dust. So interstellar gas is usually what we're thinking about as forming new stars. This is usually hydrogen, because most of our universe is hydrogen. Uh, and then dust are small particles, like silicates and permanents and other things, that you also find kind of floating around in space. And in particular, gas and dust are going to be really important for this talk, uh, because dust, the main effect of it is that it prevents us from seeing the optical light from galaxies. So if you're to look in the wavelengths that we can see with our eyes, the effect of this dust that we find in galaxies is that it absorbs all of that light and it re-radiates it at longer wavelengths. So we'll talk more about this later, but I just wanted to go ahead and introduce it. Um, and then the last component of galaxies is dark matter. Uh, I can't show you a picture because we don't know what it is. So I'm going to basically forget about it for the rest of this talk. Um, so basically galaxies are, you know, all of these many components and you have to look at all of them at the same time to really understand what galaxies are doing and how they're evolving. And so this is actually why I really love being someone who studies galaxies because we have to think about things uh, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We have to think about things that are happening on very short time scales, like far, far less than a second and very long time scales, like billions and billions of years. And so it's very complicated and very messy, and we're never actually going to fully understand it, but we have to keep on trying. So just to, uh, to show you a couple of pretty pictures of galaxies. So these are all Hubble images. I promise I'll get to the JWST images later. Um, so galaxies often come in these kind of spirals, which hopefully you can see. Um, you get the light off the screen over there? Yeah. yeah. The lights a little bit. Yeah. Um, much. Um, so uh, as we're doing that, I'll just keep talking about this one. Um, so this is a this is a disk galaxy, um, like our Milky Way. So it has these spiral arms that go out like this. If you're looking on uh, Zoom, hopefully you can see this uh, spiral arms as well. Um, and so uh, these galaxies are kind of shaped like pancakes. So right here we're looking kind of face down on top of the pancake. Um, this is another disk galaxy that we're seeing again, kind of looking down at the top of that pancake. This one is a barred spiral. Um, so this is a kind of a bar going across it, and then these big spiral arms. Oh, there it is. Okay, I promise the pictures are very pretty. I can see them. Um, all right, so in addition to um, these kind of spiral galaxies, I have one more example. Um, so this is an edge on spiral. So now we're looking kind of through the middle of the pancake, which is why it looks kind of extended like this. Um, and then there's another kind of main class of galaxies, in addition to these spiral galaxies. Uh, these are called elliptical galaxies because they look like ellipses. Um, they're generally much redder, they're much older, and they're actually not forming any new stars. So these things you call them like red and dead galaxies, which sounds very boring, but these are the ones that I mostly study, so I promise they're more exciting than they look. Um, and as one example of this, you often find these elliptical galaxies in the centers of these massive galaxy clusters, where you can see all of these old galaxies um, that are actually so massive that they're bending the light from these background galaxies around them. And so, you know, the idea here is that if you're going to study these local galaxies, you can try and understand how they form and why they look the way they do. And, you know, to make kind of an analogy here, this is like looking at fossils. You know, we're looking at these bones of these dinosaur galaxies, um, I think I'm going to go earlier, hopefully. Um, 
<laughs> not everybody's phone goes off at once. Um, so, you know, so this is the example of, you know, we're looking at these, these galaxies in the local universe and we're trying to figure out how they got to be the way that they are today. But the coolest thing about astronomy is that we don't just look at fossils, um, we actually get to go and look at the real live dinosaur. And so this is this phenomenon um, called cosmological redshift. And fundamentally, this is because light doesn't travel infinitely fast. It takes light some amount of time to get from one point to another point. And so what this means is that if we're this little guy over here and we're looking at our telescope at a, at a galaxy, if that galaxy is relatively close to us, it didn't take the light very long to travel from that galaxy to us. And so we're looking at that galaxy as it was relatively recently in the past. This is our kind of fossil galaxy. On the other hand, if we're looking at this other galaxy that's much further away from us, it took the light from that galaxy a really long time to travel through space to get from that distant galaxy to us today. And so if we're standing here on the same night with our telescope, and we're looking at both of these two galaxies, we're actually seeing this one as it was further in the past because we're, we've had to wait for the light from that very far galaxy to travel all the way to us. And so I really want to emphasize this point because it means that we have a time machine, right? So all we have to do to look back in time is to look farther and farther away. So the question then becomes like, can we actually look at galaxies that are very far away in order to look at those galaxies in the distant past? Um, and so the you know, kind of question here is, is uh, because galaxies are fainter as they're further away. You know, so this is a pretty uh, understandable phenomenon. If we take this galaxy, we put it further and further away, it generally gets smaller and fainter. And there's some point at which we just can't see it anymore. And so when we were looking with ground-based telescopes, we really couldn't see these very faint distant galaxies. And we actually didn't think that there were that many galaxies when the universe was very young, because it takes some amount of time for galaxies to form. And this all changed when we launched the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, this is a picture of Hubble. It was launched actually uh, a couple years before I was born, so we've had it for a while. Um, and we actually thought, based on our observations from the ground, that if galaxies in the distant past looked like galaxies today, um, that we wouldn't actually be able to see them, because they would be too small and too faint, and we just wouldn't have been able to see them in public. Uh, but, you know, astronomers basically have the task of looking for things um, that we aren't expecting. And this is something that we've been doing for a very long time. This is a quote actually from Edwin Hubble after this telescope was named uh, when they were um, opening the Palomar Observatory and you know some reporter was like, what do you hope to find? And the thing that he most hoped to find was something that we weren't expecting. And so, you know, we took this kind of idea when we were at, right after the Hubble was launched, and we took this extremely expensive, extremely awesome space telescope, and we decided to look at nothing. Um, so this was the very first Hubble Ultra Deep Field. On this, basically, we decided to look at this very small patch of sky. This is the size of the deep field compared to the moon. Um, so this is really a tiny, tiny patch of sky. It had like three very, very faint stars in it. And so we pointed Hubble at it for multiple days, just staring at this deep patch of sky to see what unexpected things we could find. We found that it wasn't just a couple of stars in this tiny patch. It was actually full of galaxies. So this is a Hubble view of the ultra deep field. And so the idea is that if we want to, all these galaxies are very, very far away. Most of them are, you know, when the universe was half its current age or less. And so we can directly observe these distant galaxies to actually understand the evolution and the formation of our universe. And so this is, you know, our, our tiny little dinosaurs of many different ages and that we can look at directly. But we're actually fundamentally limited by the wavelength uh, range that we can throw with Hubble. Hubble can't see infrared light. So um, to explain why we care about infrared light, I want to think back to this idea of our time machine, um, that looking far away is looking back in time. And there's another piece of this redshift effect, which is that light gets stretched along the way from wherever it uh, got emitted to us. And this is because actually the universe itself is expanding. And so as that light is traveling through empty space, the 
light itself gets stretched and it looks redder. And so if we're looking at this galaxy that's relatively close by, the light was emitted with some wavelength, and we see it pretty much the same as it was emitted. But if we're looking at this galaxy that's very far away, that light gets stretched as it's traveling those vast, fast distances between this galaxy and us. And that light, uh, as it gets stretched, looks redder. And so to kind of show you what this, what this looks like, this is a kind of a, the electromagnetic spectrum going from very uh, long wavelengths over here in the, in the infrared through the visible part of the spectrum that we can see with our eyes, through the ultraviolet, and then the high energy stuff like x-rays. And so if we're trying to look at this galaxy, and we want to see the ultraviolet light from that galaxy, it is close by. The wavelength of that, uh, so if it's 7 billion light years away, we're seeing as it, it as it was something like 7 billion light years ago, because that's how long it took that light to get from it to us. And then if we want to see the light that was emitted in the ultraviolet, we have to look in the visible part of the spectrum. And that's fine, because we can do that with Hubble. But on the other hand, if this, if this galaxy um, is much further away, and we're in this, this scenario when we're looking at it, it is 11 billion years, uh, light years away, we're seeing it as it was, something like 11 billion light years ago, and that light has gotten so stretched that it's no longer in the ultraviolet, it's no longer in the visible, it's all the way into the infrared part of the spectrum. And so what this means is that we have a time machine, we can look far away to look back in time, but it's a time machine with a big asterisk, basically, because the further away we want to look, the red of the light we have to look at. And so this means that we want to see into the infrared to be able to see the very beginning of the universe. So this is a um, kind of a schematic of the entire history of the universe in one, in one image. So we start down here with the Big Bang, and we go through the formation of the very first stars, the formation of the very first galaxies, and then those galaxies age and turn into the kinds of galaxies that we see in the local universe until we get all the way up to the present day. And so because in order to see into the past, we have to look far away, and we have to look at this redder and redder light, so we can direct, directly map this kind of time axis onto wavelength. And we can ask, what is Hubble actually able to see given the wavelength coverage? And it turns out Hubble's limit is here in the near infrared. And so it's able to see modern galaxies, but it's not able to see the formation of the first galaxies. And it's certainly not able to see the formation of the first stars. Uh, and so this is fundamentally one of the main reasons that we decided to uh, build and launch JWST is because it can see this redder and redder light. And so it can see the formation of the first galaxies directly. So we are basically letting our time machine go back another couple of billion years just because we're able to see that red or light. And then there's another reason that we want to look at the infrared, and that's because different colors of light actually give us different information about the galaxy. And so as an example, um, that's a little, you know, not a galaxy example. This is a visible light from some, you know, uh, very few computers. Um, and so this is the light that goes screen of your eyes as much as you. If you instead take a picture of these different animals in infrared, infrared light is what we humans sense as heat, and the picture looks really different. All of a sudden, you can see that these little guys are glowing, and this guy is not, because he's cold blood. Right? So you're getting information by looking in a different part of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. And the same thing is true with galaxies. So this is a, um, a picture of the pillars of creation, which is a star forming nebula. And this is a picture of visible light that we get with Hubble. And so the thing that we're seeing here is fundamentally we're seeing stars that are forming inside these very dense cocoons of this gas and dust that I was telling you about before. So you can see a couple stars here and then these big pillars of gas and dust. And if we look at red wavelengths, if we look at near infrared light, this is the picture we see of the same exact region. You can see it looks very, very different. All of a sudden, all of these stars pop out. And that's because this dust that was just carrying the light from these stars in the optical part of the spectrum, you can see right through it once you go to the infrared. 
And so basically here you're seeing the light that's shining through everything but the very densest dust. And then if you go to longer wavelengths still, this is what the picture looks like. It's much lower resolution because it's been very hard historically for us to get good the pictures in the in the mid infrared. Um, but actually here what you're seeing is the dust itself is glowing. And so you can study the properties of the dust in galaxies by looking at these longest wavelengths. And so we want to see into the infrared because with Hubble, even for these close by galaxies, we were limited to just this view. We could only see the visible light from nearby galaxies. We weren't able to see either one of these pictures. And so that view of galaxies that we were getting at Hubble was actually quite biased. So you can think you know, of a basic question that you might want to ask about this image is how many stars are there? And so which picture you look at, you get a very different answer. Because here, these stars are so obscured by, by dust that you, uh, sorry, here they're so obscured by dust that you can't actually get the total number, uh, no matter how hard you try and count. Because that light is just totally obscured and you can't see it. And so, you know, for both of these reasons, to see the formation of the first galaxies and to get this less biased view of galaxies that are more local, um, we actually astronomers started planning for the next generation space telescope in 1989 before the Hubble Space Telescope was even launched because we knew that this was going to be the next step. And so, you know, this was quite a while ago. Um, many people spent many, many decades, um, you know, trying to figure out the best way to design this telescope and to build it. And what we settled on is a telescope that has um, 18 mirror segments. So these over here on the left are these uh, gold plated beryllium hexagonal mirror segments. Um, and we wanted it to be uh, this big segment in here because a larger mirror means more collecting area, means more photons, means better pictures. And then also, uh, you know, this is looking at infrared light, which is heat. And so we don't want the telescope to be, uh, you know, sensitive to the heat that's coming from the Earth or from the sun. And so it has this tennis court sized sun shield between it and the sun, so it's always in the shade. And then lastly, you can't launch a whole tennis court sized thing into space on a rocket because that just doesn't work. Um, yeah, unfortunately, maybe someday. Um, so the thing has 139 actuators and eight different motors that deploy to unfold it once it's in space. And if that doesn't sound hard enough, the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to put it a million miles away, right? And again, this is so that it's not seeing the heat from the Earth um, and from the sun as much. So it's in the cold darkness of empty space all by itself taking three pictures for us. And so this is why this took so long is because all of these things that we were trying to do are very hard and very, very complicated and we couldn't fix it if anything goes wrong. Once the thing is a million miles away, like it had better work because humans have never gone that far away ourselves. So we're not going to be able to fix it. And so uh, just a couple pictures of, of this thing as it was finished um, constructing and, and going into space. Uh, so this is it folded into the launch position, then got put on a boat from California to the launch site, which is um, in Peru and French Guiana. Um, it was then put onto this Ariane 5 rocket. Um, they lifted it up and put it in this rocket housing. Uh, and then it was launched on December 25th, uh, 2021. I'm sure at least some of you were watching the launch live. It was at like 4 a.m. California time on you know, Christmas morning. I was sitting there in bed, like, I hope I can go back to sleep if it blows up. Um, <laughs> it didn't blow up. It was amazing. Um, so actually, the launch went phenomenally well. And we only figured out just how well it went later, because this thing originally was supposed to be uh, limited in its lifetime by the amount of fuel that it had on board, because it has to get to that point a million miles away and then stay there and stay in orbit. Um, and so it was supposed to only last five to ten years. And this launch went so perfectly that that five to 10 year mission lifetime went all the way up to 20 or more years. Yeah, I know, we're in space. They did a really great job. Um, so this is the last view that humans will have of JWST directly as it's launched into you know, the black piece of empty space. And then after that, um, it got to this orbit, which is at this, again, this is actually not even a to scale drawing. It's like compressed because this thing is so far away. 
So Hubble's in near Earth orbit up here, so we could go put eyeglasses on it when we didn't get the mirror quite right when we launched it. JWST is instead a million miles away at this so-called second Lagrange point between, um, between the Earth, Moon, and Sun system. Um, and so uh, as it was uh, you know, getting to its final point and its orbit, it unfolded. This was a month-long sequence where every single one of those 139 actuators and those eight motors, motors had to do exactly what they were designed to do exactly perfectly. Right? So this was a very tense time for every astronomer. We were like monitoring, like, you know, refreshing the NASA feed, because that was how all of us were figuring out about this. And again, everything worked. The telescope is working. It got to the right point, it all unfolded. There was basically six months for this so-called commissioning process. So this is uh, the process by which we're aligning all of the mirrors and testing all of the instruments. So this is six months of people from every one of the instrument teams being up 24-7, monitoring the telescope for performing tests. And so the first image, one of the first images that we got was um, a demonstration of uh, just what you see when you look at a star with a telescope. So this is the kind of previous best image that we had at long wavelengths of a star. A star, those are laws in the background, those are probably galaxies. And as I play this, it'll fade the JWST image of the same thing. And you can see, yeah, please, wow. Oh, yeah, this is not okay. There will be more. Um, so, so you can see the star in the middle just shrink down this tiny point with these huge diffraction spikes coming off of it. That's how you know it's a star. And now all these fuzzy blobs that you could tell there was maybe something there, all of a sudden we're able to resolve the structures of these. And these are all distant galaxies. And you can see tons of galaxies that were too faint for us to see before popping out of nothing just in this image. Um, so this was, this was really exciting. Um, and so we're starting to get um, basically the first data release um, of real kind of science images from JWST was in uh, mid-July, it's been a very busy time since then. Um, so this is one of the first images. This is Stefan's Quintet. Um, which you'll recognize this is a Hubble image. If you've seen it's a wonderful light, um, this features in that. Um, so this is a this one on the left is a foreground galaxy, it's pretty close by. And then these four galaxies are more distant and they're actually in the process of merging. So these galaxies are, are in the process of colliding with each other. So that's the Hubble view. Um, if we look at the JWST view um, with the near pan instruments, so this is near infrared light, um, you can see kind of you know similar structures. This thing looks pretty different. You can see all this resolved stuff that's happening. That's because we're able to see past the dust in this galaxy. We also see this big, um, this thing that you can't really see in this image. There's maybe something here. Pops out in this new JWST image. Um, that's actually a shock from the these galaxies as they're merging. And then we also, instead of looking at the near infrared uh, with JWST, we can also look into the far infrared, so even redder light. Um, and this is the view that you get with that mirroring instrument. This is stunning if you think back to that colors of creation image that was like a fuzzy blob and then you could tell what was going on. That was the best we had before. And all of a sudden, you can see all of this beautiful, beautiful structure. That shock comes out really well. And then this little point source at the center of this galaxy, that's actually this supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy that we're now able to study with this mirroring instrument. Um, and so I want to tell you a bit about some of the first science results that we're getting from these JWS images. So, you know, again, this is, uh, this is early days. We've only had data for a couple months. Um, but I want to start by talking about the very first galaxies. Um, so this is uh, back to this kind of graphic I showed before. Because we can now look in the infrared, we're able to look at galaxies, these fir first galaxies that are forming, just three to 400 million years after the Big Bang. And three to 400 million years sounds like a really long time, but in terms of the history of the universe, that's really, really short. Um, so that's like 2% of the total age of the universe. So it'd be like, instead of looking at me now, you're looking back in time to see me as I was at like seven months old, right? So we're really seeing the beginning of the universe here. And our expectations from what we've seen with Hubble is that we would find a couple of very small, very big galaxies that probably look really distant from things that we see today. And so this is kind of a plot showing what we saw before with Hubble. This is how bright galaxies are. So 
at the top are bright things, the bottom are pink things, as a function of redshift, which is this measure of how much that light gets stretched and how far away these galaxies are. And so, you know, we found a couple pretty distant galaxies. This is kind of the most distant one that we knew of. And then as soon as we got these first images from JWST, um, we started looking for these candidates for these very first galaxies. Um, so my colleague on found these two galaxies that are candidates for some of the very first galaxies that we've ever seen. And then other teams also started finding all of these candidates for the very first galaxies. These are some of many, many references on the bottom of all the papers people have already tried to write on the first galaxies in JWST. Um, and then the question is, are we finding too many, right? Um, and so this is a, this is a plot from um, uh, one of these many papers led by Steve Finkelstein um, of how many kind of first galaxies we're expecting to see as a function of how bright they are. And ignore all, what, all the labels on the lines. These are just different models theoretical models, given what we know about the universe of how many early galaxies we should find. And in Steve's paper, he was just looking at one of these candidate first galaxies, and that data point is here. So he already found more galaxies by finding one galaxy that's so bright um, that he's basically his data point is above almost all of these models by a factor of several. And so it's looking like we have a lot of very early galaxies in the universe. Uh, some of these might not survive a more detailed kind of look with um, the near stack instrument on JWS, you can just need it to confirm them. Some of these might be closer than we think, but still, um, it, we're in a moment where it seems like we're finally many more early galaxies than we expected, and the massive galaxies are forming much earlier than we expected. Um, and my guess is that in the second talk on cosmology, Simon will talk about what this means for our understanding of our model of the whole universe. The other thing about these first galaxies is that they don't look quite like what we thought. So these are the two galaxies from Rohan's paper. This one is about what we expected. It's a little compact blob. I know this is not nearly as beautiful as the data I showed you earlier, but these are, again, like looking back in time to when the universe was 2% of its current age. The other of these distant galaxies actually looks like a disk. It's elongated on this axis, which if you think back to the pictures I was showing you earlier, this is kind of like looking through that, that pancake of the galaxy. And the weird thing is that we really didn't expect to find disks this early in the universe. And that's because this is a, this is a um, simulation of two disk galaxies merging, um, is that mergers completely wreck disks. So even though here we started out with two disk galaxies, um, this is a really slow movie, but if you wait around to the end, you end up with basically just a total train wreck. This thing isn't able to form this disk um, after this merger. And so because we think there are lots of mergers in the early universe, um, it's really unexpected to be finding these disk galaxies so early. And so the question is like with JWST, are there not as many mergers as we thought? Are galaxies able to form disks even though there are many mergers? Um, we're still really trying to figure this out, but many different studies at this point have confirmed this large number of disk galaxies in the early universe. This is an example from my colleague Brent Robertson at UC Santa Cruz, um, where he's just pulling out a bunch of pictures of these early galaxies, all of which seem to be disks. Um, and so if you try and quantify this, um, this is a fraction of galaxies that are disks instead of some other shape of galaxy as a function of redshift, where zero here is the local universe and six is the universe as it was very long in the past. And this is the view that we got with Hubble, where you see these data points are, you know, there's some number of disk galaxies locally and it drops off quite quickly as you go into the distant universe. And instead, the JWST points are way up here. So there's tons more disks than we thought there were up to a factor of 10 greater than we were expecting with Hubble. And so, you know, why this is, we're still trying to figure out. It's possibly that we're looking at them as they are in red wavelengths, possibly that we're able to integrate longer and bigger features, and we're still trying to work it out. We're also seeing the formation of the very first spiral bars. Um, so this is, a, this is an example of a galaxy. This is a single phase on spiral galaxy. It's in the near infrared going to redder and redder light. Um, this, in this Hubble image, this is the reddest band that we have on Hubble. The center of this galaxy is kind of like, I don't know, circular-ish. And then as we go to the redder and redder light that we're starting to get because of JWST, 
all of a sudden you can see this this is extended here into one of these spiral bars. Um, and so this is the first identification of all these bar features when the universe was less than half of its current age. And this is a picture of all of these six that this paper found of these spiral bars. And these are really important because these are instabilities in the disk that are able to funnel molecular gas very effectively to the centers of the galaxy, and they can actually dramatically change how the galaxy changes over time. Um, we're also seeing the formation of the first globular clusters. So globular clusters in the local universe look like this. They're um, these very, very old, very dense clumps of um, stars that we see usually on the outskirts of galaxies. And we don't know why they form. Uh, we don't know how old they are. They're like very mysterious. And they're so old that it's actually really hard to tell much about them. Um, and so in a paper led by my colleague Mia Mola, she looked at this. This is the hollow image of the galaxy. It's like just completely fuzzy. You then look at the JWST image. It resolves into this, this big long structure with all these little points. Um, so they're calling us the sparkler. Um, and in all of these things that are circled, like you can admit some of them actually, all of these are cluster clusters that are seen right after they're forming. Uh, and so the hope is that we can try and understand why these globular clusters look the way that they do uh, now that we're able to see them as they were um, much further in the past. We're also finding that galaxies seem much smaller than we have thought originally. Um, so uh, this is because uh, the centers of galaxies seem to be much redder than we have thought. Uh, and that's because the centers are either older or dustier than the outskirts. Um, so this is a model, these are, uh, this is the JWST data of a couple galaxies. Um, and this is basically the JWST model uh, data minus the best fit model that we had in the bubble. And you can see there's all this light left over at the center. So that's telling us that the model from Hubble is underestimated how bright the centers of these galaxies really are at these red wavelengths. Um, so actually galaxies are about 30% smaller than we thought that they were before. Um, and so this really upends our understanding of how galaxy sizes are growing. Um, I will skip this. So we're also finding these whole populations of galaxies that we had never seen before. Um, so this is an HST image, and as they blink back and forth to the JWST image, you can see that galaxy, that big red thing, pops out of absolutely nowhere. Um, so this is a relatively local galaxy, and it was just so obscured by dust that we couldn't see it before with Hubble. And so we're still trying to really characterize these populations of galaxies and try and figure out how they're contributing to our understanding of the overall kind of evolution of, of um, galaxy populations. These are just a couple of examples of these really red galaxies that we're finding for the first time with JWST. And this is really, again, the first time we've been able to study the structures of these things in detail because of this incredible spatial resolution of the telescope. Um, and so I want to then talk a little bit about what's next. You know, I flashed a bunch of science results. Um, there's not really a unified picture yet because we're still working on it because we've only had data for a couple months. And so some of the things that I am most excited about learning in the, in the coming couple years are to study the details of physics that's happening in these very first galaxies. Um, we also might be able to see the formation of the very first stars. Um, maybe, maybe we've already seen them and we haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, also, I think we are, we'll be able to get a full census of star formation across cosmic history. So we'll be able to, for, for the first time, really account for those galaxy populations that we weren't able to see before because they were too dust obscured. Um, and then we'll be able to look at the detailed structures of galaxies that are more local and really understand how they're growing and why they're changing. And so I want to talk a little bit about um, one project. Um, this is the Jade's um, team. This is many of us in Tucson like two weeks ago because we just had a bunch of big us. We were all there um, figuring out how to, how to analyze it. Um, and we're doing an 800 hour survey with JWST. This is a joint project of the near CAM and near spec instrument teams. Um, and these are going to be the deepest images that humans have ever, ever taken. Um, and actually, JWST is, is observing for this program like this very moment, um, which is really exciting. Um, and so I got 
uh, permission to show you a couple of uh, example images from this survey. So this is the HST view, the Hubble Space Telescope view at 1.6 microns. This is a bunch of blobs. These are all galaxies. When we look at it in this new deep imaging from JWST, all of a sudden we can see very detailed structures of these things. So this galaxy at the top that was just a blob is now resolved into multiple components that are all kind of different colors. We're seeing this thing at the bottom instead of being a blob is actually this is a point source. This is another supermassive black hole. And so this is kind of an example of how we're going to be able to study these detailed structures of distant galaxies. Um, and then this is another example. This is a disk galaxy as seen by Hubble. Um, so these are the spiral arms here. There's this faint red thing in the upper left that um, is kind of unclear whether or not it's associated with this galaxy, if it's like a star forming region in the galaxy, or if it's something behind this galaxy that we're kind of seeing as a chance projection. And then as soon as we look at a JWST image, this disk is just absolutely beautiful. You see all these star forming regions. This thing here is probably associated with the galaxy. It's a really, really bright star forming region. You can see all this emission filled in where we couldn't see it before with Hubble because it was too dust obscured. And actually these regions, these star forming regions that look blue here, now look pink. And they're pink actually because they're glowing from the light of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, PAHs, which are uh, like when you burn something on your grill and then you try and scrape up all the black stuff. That's that, but in space. That's what I mean. um, so we're hoping to do detailed studies of dust emission in these galaxies and understand the physics that's going on there. And then one last example. Um, this is a little bit more zoomed out in those previous pictures. Um, so this is a galaxy in the center a couple other blobs over here. And then when we look at this in this J's imaging, all of a sudden, that thing in the middle, yeah, I think this one deserves another round, yeah, honestly. Um, so that thing in the middle that looks like a blob is now this absolutely beautiful spiral galaxy. Um, this is a flocculent spiral. It has like many different spiral arms here. You can see these uh, star forming regions popping out in great detail. And this, I think, is an example of why we're seeing so many more disks now with JWST, is that that's, that doesn't look like a disk, that looks like a train wreck, and all of a sudden it's a disk now in HST. And then the other reason that I picked this image in particular is because it's maybe a little bit hard to see with the lighting, maybe better for the folks on Zoom, but there's all of these things, all of these objects that I circled in this one tiny cutout of this one tiny region on the sky that we've looked at. None of these are in the existing Hubble imaging. Even though this Hubble imaging is some of the deepest imaging that humans have ever taken to date. And so we're really going to be able to study the properties of these faint galaxies in a lot of detail now with this new imaging. And so I want to kind of just conclude by saying that, you know, the reason that we kind of had JWST is that we wanted to look at these longer wavelengths of infrared light that are letting us see the formation of the first galaxies and letting us look at the detailed properties of galaxies even more locally. And in just the first couple months of, uh, of data from JWST, we've seen a lot of advances in understanding these first galaxies. But I really do think we're still in this era of discovery where we're still hoping to find things that we hadn't expected. We're still looking for these things that don't agree with our models of how the galaxy, uh, how the universe forms and evolves, and trying to you know, piece them together into some coherent picture. So I'm hoping that all of you will stay tuned for, there's going to be many, many more awesome science results with JWST, with galaxies, with cosmology, with exoplanets, um, and beyond. So thank you so much for your attention. Um, that's all I have, but I'm happy to take questions. Good evening, and I can see some three hands here. Okay, well, the so first and uh, for all person questions, I will also repeat that so everyone can hear especially our audience. Go ahead. To help you communicate cosmology conclusions, um, does the smaller and older galaxies tend to support the idea of primordial black holes? Okay, so I'm gonna just repeat that for everyone. Um, so, um, without, without any cosmological uh, judgment, uh, well, the older and smaller galaxies um, support the idea of primordial uh, black holes. I'm actually rephrasing that right. Yeah, yeah, so just to kind of explain a little bit for, for those who are 
whom this term is maybe not so familiar. So um, black holes, like I said in the very beginning, you can get black holes if we wait around for stars to die. That's kind of the way that we see most black holes and then they grow over time. There's this question of whether or not you can form black holes in the extremely early universe by basically the gas collapsing directly into a black hole or just a black hole being there um, when the universe kind of started. And so I think we're not able to answer that question just yet. Um, so the question of like, when are we seeing emission from the very first black holes is a really interesting one. Um, and I think it's something that people are especially excited to look at with this MIRI instrument. Um, I don't think that we're necessarily able to say anything about it based on kind of the, um, the ages and the sizes of the galaxies that we're seeing so far, but hopefully stay tuned for more results later. Great. Um, so I'm gonna just take one online question, but we'll have more of opportunities for um, in person audience. So Manitou Allen asked, um, do we have a date, target, and duration for data to see deep field image? Since we talked about the Hubble deep field, yeah. Um, what do you think is the most interesting part of this image if we were to have it? Yeah. So um, we've already taken several deep fields, actually. So. I showed you Stefan's Quintet, which was one of the first um, images that we took. Another one of the first images was in this um, cluster. It's called SNAPS, uh, and it's got some telephone number um, afterwards. And so that's being called JWST's first deep field. And so that's where we were finding some of these candidates for the very first galaxies. Um, we've also already taken um, the Sears program, which is the background of this slide, which is certainly a deep field. Um, you can go online and download this data and look at it and play with it yourself and, you know, find whatever you want to find in it. And then we're, you know, taking more data every day. Great. Yes. Uh, when do you think you'll have information on, on the Earth-like planets that James Webb Telescope yeah. is going to look at mm -hmm. and see if their atmospheres might have been transformed by living microbes or beings? That is a great question that I'm going to delay to our lecture entirely about that. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, Ren might be, okay, so the question was, when will we have the information, basically, on actual planets, especially those Earth-like, um, to detect potentially extraterrestrial life, right? Um, so, we actually have another um, lecture uh, next January specifically to talk about exoplanet and atmosphere, but Ren, if you want to offer any insights into that, please. yeah, yeah, so this is kind of one of the other many science cases for JWST is to look at planets orbiting other stars and try and see what we can find in their atmospheres. Um, so they've certainly found some emission lines, um, and I don't know the most up-to-date uh, kind of results from that. Um, I think that they've found several molecules in, in exoplanet atmospheres. Yeah, that could be vital signature. Um, so, if you want to learn more about that, make sure to come back in January. Yeah. <laughs> okay, over there. Uh, so, do we expect to find the physics of early galaxies galaxy mm -hmm. is actually different from what we see today? Do we expect to be that accurate? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so, the question was uh, do we expect to see anything different? Uh, any, any difference between the first galaxies and the current galaxies or like the present day galaxies, right? So I would expect yes. Um, and that's because, you know, the universe was much younger. It's much hotter. It's much denser. There's much more gas floating around. Um, so, you know, an example that we were talking about recently, you know, all of space kind of in the local universe is about three Kelvin. It's three degrees above absolute zero. Um, if you go to these higher redshifts and these more local um, or these more distant galaxies, that increases by a factor of 10. And so the question of like, are you going to form stars the same way? It's not obvious that you would. Um, and so I think we weren't totally expecting what they were going to look like. My kind of impression is that they were going to be much, uh, much smaller and much humpier and much burstier. Um, which to some extent we're finding, but also we're finding all these disks and all these barred spirals out to like redshift four, which is super surprising to me. So I think it's a question that we're actively still working on, um, and then hopefully characterizing the very first galaxies in more detail. Great, and actually there's an online question just right as we are talking about redshift. So Alpha Spectrum asks, how do you even get a number that represents your question? 
Oh, yeah, that's a good, great question. I totally glossed over this because I wanted to show you pretty pictures and some boring in physics. Um, but basically, the, the number for redshift is telling us about um, how much that light gets stretched. So it's kind of a multiplicative factor. And so the way that we calculate redshift um, is actually because different um, elements that, uh, that are in galaxies, like especially hydrogen, there's lots and lots of hydrogen in the universe, but other um, elements as well, um, emit, they have this kind of spectral signature. Um, so for example, there's this H alpha line, which uh, corresponds to a quantum physics transition in the hydrogen atom. And you know that that's at 65, 63 angstroms. And so you can look in your galaxy at where it actually is, and then basically just take a ratio of those, and that's the ratio. Great, over there. Great talk. Um, <laughs> what do you think is more likely that the um, physics behind galaxy formation is the origin of the galaxy formation is incorrect, or that the timeline of events of galaxy formation is correct, and the universe is actually much older than we anticipate? <laughs> Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Fred, I'll probably even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, so, yeah. So, so the question is basically is our understanding of the physics of galaxy formation wrong, or is the universe actually just older than we thought it was? Um, I don't think we're yet seeing any evidence that the universe is older than it was. We have a lot of different um, observations that are built over the course of you know many decades that inform our understanding of how old the universe is. Um, and in particular, you know, I just mentioned that the universe is like three, three degrees above absolute zero. Um, that's because of this cosmic microwave background signal um, that a lot of people study in great, great detail. Many people at TIPAC actually, in order to understand kind of the, um, the physics that is describing our universe as a whole. So I don't think for galaxies, like, like I said, galaxies are very messy, very complicated, and we probably got them totally that's definitely nice. Also, it means I have a job here. <laughs> I will take you on that. Um, cool. So, um, one question from the online audience um, asking, well, you mentioned that Hubble cannot really see too red into the wavelengths. Yep. Why? Yeah. Um, so, basically, when you're building an instrument, you have to make choices about what you know instrument you're going to build. Um, and so the reddest wavelength that Hubble can see is at 1.6 microns. And this is partially a design choice um, based on the size of the telescope. Um, so you, for shorter and shorter wavelengths of light, a smaller telescope will get you pretty good images. And as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, you need bigger and bigger telescopes in order to get sensitive images. So that's part of it. And then the other reason is that um, we're really good at building cameras that look at optical light because people pay a lot of money for cameras and for and so there's like technology that's been developed. And so actually these cameras that work in the infrared, there's not really an industry demand for them nearly as much, so they're very expensive and the technology is very far behind optical light. Great, I love that answer. <laughs> Hello. Um, even if you do discover the circumstances surrounding galaxy formation and like figure it out, what does it change about life on Earth? Like, what's the point of all the research? Yeah. Oh, great. So, yeah. This is just a philosophical question uh, about um, so, what does it actually do to our day to day life, right? Even yeah. if we figure it out, galaxy formation is completely wrong. Yeah, I mean, I've asked this question of myself like every month for the whole generation. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I think it is, a, it is really a philosophical question. So, you know, in my day-to-day -day life, nothing is going to change based on my knowledge of distant galaxies. Um, but I think, you know, I got at least a couple of oohs and ahs. I think that it's like humans have this desire to understand where we come from and why, you know, why the universe looks the way it does. We've been looking at the night sky since probably before we were humans, really, by any kind of consideration. And, and we've been telling ourselves these stories about how the universe got to be the way it was. And so this is kind of a modern day you know, recreation of I'm trying to figure out how the universe is the way it is. And I feel like very grateful to have this as my job to not do anything that's particularly useful. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it's actually pretty great. Um, I don't know if that's a satisfying answer. I go back and forth myself on whether it's a satisfying answer. So ask me again if I do this. Well, I, I don't think our day-to-day life would be 
anything different. He doesn't know there was no ticket at the state, but here you guys are in person <laughs> online. So I'm sure you are all curious about, you know, how our universe might shed some light on our, you know, life or wisdom in some sort. Okay. So when you look at this uh, process of couple to uh, James Red, yeah. um, in terms of what's next, like where's the limit in terms of programming and how's that going to go? Can you go like just you know, like when does it become Great question. Um, so the question was when you're comparing the Hubble and the JWST and you're looking way back um, into time, but how you know back in time you could actually probe, right? Like what if it was a limit? Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't have the number off the top of my head because doing math in front of this many people is a very spooky concept. Um, so we're you know, we're able to see kind of the, the light, the respiratory and ultraviolet coming from these galaxies at like redshift 20, which is really quite short after the Big Bang. Um, we're not going to see the CMB, um, that's at different wavelengths. So, you know, JWST is going to solve everything. Um, and in particular, you know, we're getting this really, really good view of the near infrared and the mid infrared. Um, the near instrument is much lower resolution. Um, things get harder as you go further into the infrared. And there's also, like I was showing you before, you get different views of galaxies, even local galaxies, by looking at them in different wavelengths. And so I also happen to do a lot of radio astronomy um, because they're, that's how you study the gas in galaxies. So there's lots left to answer that we won't be able to do with JWST. This is just the thing that uh, every astronomer I know is most excited about right now because it's new in Chinese and it makes Great. And we have another um, online question from Michelle Gesslin asking, is there a reason why early galaxies are shaped as disks rather than as um, a dwar a morphous shapes? Yeah. Yeah. So we, so we had thought that they were going to be these kind of amorphous blocks. Like, that was my expectation. So finding that there are so many of these disks is actually quite surprising to me um, in one sense. But also, um, you know, Generally, um, things do like to form disks in the universe, and that's because they have uh, gas has some amount of angular momentum, and so it doesn't collapse into a point. It basically always collapses in a rotating disk because of the conservation of angular momentum. So maybe it's not, maybe it shouldn't be surprising, um, but I don't know. We were all surprised by it. So. <laughs> um, great over there. Hi. Um, you mentioned that. Um, before the Hubble telescope was launched, they were already planning for the James Webb mm -hmm. telescope. Yes. So our preparations were already being made for the next one. <laughs> That's a fantastic question. So the question is basically, what's next? You know, have we already started planning for the next telescopes? And the answer is yes. We have lots of dreams of what we want. Um, and so this is disturbing in large part. Actually, you know, astronomy is an interesting science because we all have to pool together because. Nobody has enough billions of dollars on their own to put a telescope into space. It has to be a consortium of many different nations. And so astronomy as a whole, actually, every 10 years, we get together and do this thing called the Decadal Review. And we get all of the astronomers together, and they all write all these papers about the exciting things that we want to do. And then they get kind of ranked by the community. So we decide what our most important priorities are. And so one of the priorities for upcoming astronomy is going to be a next generation space telescope. But the concepts for that are actually not really well known. Um, so we're still working on figuring out what that's going to be. A couple other next generation things that I'm really excited about. Um, one of them is the next generation VLA. Um, so the very large array is a radio telescope that's in New Mexico. Right now it's in the desert in Sephora. Um, if you see contact, like that scene where Jimmy Foster drives around with like, the headphones and there's all these big dishes, that's the VLA. Um, so there's a plan to expand the VLA across actually the entire state of New Mexico and several surrounding states. Um, and that's basically going to do a similar thing um, for the radio part of the spectrum as JWST is doing for the infrared, where we go from these fuzzy blobs to actually being able to study the detailed structures of the galaxies. So that's something that I'm really excited Fantastic. So um, one last question from the online audience. Um, this one actually comes from Eric Levine, asking how could JWST be used to help study dark matter? Yeah. Um, how could JWST be used to study dark matter? That is a good question. Um, I don't totally know. I'm sure that there are things that people are planning. One 
example is um, that we can look at the amount of dark matter through what's called comparing um, the mass of stars that we can see in a galaxy and what's called the dynamical mass, which is basically how much uh, you can look at how things are rotated in the disk galaxy and get an estimate of the total amount of mass. And so then you can compare the mass of stars and the total mass and understand the mass of dark matter. Um, so that's something that you need um, spectroscopy for. So I uh, cheated and I showed you only images because they're much easier to explain. And also we have more of them right now. Um, but this is a lot of the planned work with the near-spec instrument, which um, can look at those line properties in detail um, and start to constrain um, dark matter fractions through this, um, this, uh, you know, this uh, Fantastic. Well, I guess that concludes our Q&A. I know a lot of you still have questions, but Ren will be here. Um, she's not going to go anywhere until the last two questions is answered. Let's thank Ren again. Fantastic. Okay, well, before we wrap up tonight, um, yes, I know you're all ready to sit down. Um, so I would like to have the name quickly introduce a few ways uh, to pull a pet back, especially if you're interested in hearing more about, um, you know, what's next uh, in this lecture series. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. So yeah, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly and just show you some of the goodies that we have for you. All right, how's that looking good? Okay, so if you like this lecture and you want to learn about anything else that we're doing, any outreach events, any research updates, you can follow us on Facebook. You still have Facebook, uh, Twitter, and also our Instagram, where we have a post all about this JWST public lecture series. So right now, you just saw Ren Seuss. Next, we'll have Cosmology with Simon Beerer, who's online right now. And then the final one will be Exoplanets with Bruce McIntosh. So come to just one, come to all three, it's up to you. And if you really, really like us, you can follow us at our outreach email list and get info about kind of what's next. Uh, so yeah, I'll just give it back to Sinan. Great, thank you, Renee. So those are all the different ways, well, thank you. <laughs> um, those are all the different ways to follow the back. And as Renee mentioned, um, well, Simon and Beer will actually be talking about um, how JWC is going to shed light on our understanding of dark matter and dark energy. Um, so that is going to happen on December 6th. Um, well, let's bring back everyone to screen again, where um, you can also you know, see our chat moderators. Um, and of course, Simon will also be there. And um, in the meantime, we would really, really appreciate your uh, feedback on how we did tonight, what you liked, what you didn't, and what other topic that you would like to hear from. So JWST, this was completely from you know, uh, our audience feedback, and we would love to produce more lecture series that you prefer to hear. So with that, um, well, thank you again for coming out tonight, and uh, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.